I'm Evan Rogester, principal conductor of the Washington National Opera and the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the Kennedy Center Couch Concert. In the midst of our global health crisis and our what you could call national identity crisis, particularly dealing with structural racism in the country, it's more important than ever that we connect in these new and innovative ways not just as artists and public, artists and audience, but simply as humans, neighbors and friends. From 1953 to 1961, there was a remarkable program on CBS called Person to Person, which was hosted by Edward R. Murrow, the great American journalist. And uh, it strikes me that this type of format is very much in that spirit, one of the First guests on the person to person was uh, then Senator John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jackie Kennedy. He also interviewed artists like Maria Callas. And the format was just this, Edward R. Murrow sitting there and going into the homes of uh, these artists and getting to meet them. And it it's almost feels to me that we've come full circle that the, the most important way that we can connect right now is to go into people's homes. When I was asked to choose a title for this particular program, um, I thought of one of the most powerful maxims in music, which is actually attributed to both uh, Mozart and Debussy. I don't know if Debussy stole it from Mozart, um, but the quote is, the music is not in the notes, but in the silence between. It strikes me that right now we are in probably the largest silence of our modern history. And as musicians, we are in between the notes. Uh, and I wanted to show you today, sort of in this person-to-person -person format, a way for you to look into the lives of the people that make those notes. The things that we're doing right now are probably more meaningful and more important than uh, what we will ever do or what we have ever done up till this moment and how we come back to making music again is critical. Um, so I wanted to share with you some of the amazing lives that, uh, are in the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra, the Washington National Opera Orchestra. And you notice that I have two titles for them, two, two names for the orchestra. They are an extremely unique orchestra in our nation, uh, very much in the tradition of the great European orchestras, which play in both the Opera House and on the symphonic stage and a number of activities. The, Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra and Washington National Opera Orchestra play opera, ballet, musical theater, chamber music, all sorts of activities. And they are, in that way, they end up being the most versatile orchestra in the nation. I'm biased and proud, but uh, it's something that I like to point out to people. Um, opera, I don't think it, it is, um, it's not a mistake that there are, these fascinating people in the orchestra because opera is a intersection of all of the art forms. You have theater, dance, music, and the visual arts all coming together in opera. And the type of person that that attracts usually has a diverse um, set of interests that there, you know, I could list off, it, could, it would take me a really long time to list off all the very uh, fascinating interest in our orchestras. But for instance, let's say um, our principal harpist, Susan Robinson, holds a degree from Harvard in French literature. Peter DeBoer, our orchestra chairman, has multiple mathematics degrees from Princeton University, from the distinguished universities of, uh, I believe it's Cambridge. Forgive me, Peter, if it's Oxford. Um, and we have uh, a champion three-time champion uh, archer, the Virginia state champion, three times as our principal base, Robert D'Imperio. So uh, when, when I stand on the podium and look around, I don't just see people who play their instruments, I see a people with a huge range of interests. And those are some of the people that I want to interest, uh, introduce to you today. Uh, Karen Lowry Tucker has been with our orchestra for 28 years. She joined in 1992. She holds a Bachelor of Music Education from the University of Louisville, a Master's of Music ed degree from the University of Texas at Austin. And her first job was with the Munich Chamber Orchestra, which is also called the Münchner Kammer Orchestra. 
and she toured with him internationally from 1979 to 1981. Upon returning to the United States, Karen had a, a remarkable fellowship with the New York Philharmonic, and which took her to um, two years at the Atlanta Symphony with the uh, legendary maestro Robert Shaw, and then, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Karen, I'm sorry, it's one year with, uh, in Atlanta and two years with the National Symphony during the tenure of the amazing musician, cellist, conductor, Mitzlaf Rostopovich. My family moved uh, to Washington only this past uh, January 25th, in fact, and we started rehearsals. Some of my first rehearsals as principal, principal conductor were in February. And at one of those very first rehearsals, Karen, in her typically understated way, wrote to me before the rehearsal and said, Maestro, do you mind if I come a few minutes late to the rehearsal? Because uh, my uncle, who is called Sam Gilliam, is being recognized for an installation that is in the Kennedy Center, new and beautiful architectural um, expansion, a, a building called The Reach. He is exhibited in that and he will be having an interview. Um, would you mind if I was just a few minutes late? Uh, I said, of course not, but not really realizing who Sam Gilliam was and the remarkable intersection in Karen's family of a, uh, this multi-generational connection to the Kennedy Center. Sam Gilliam is simply put, one of America's great artists. He is uh, someone who's really hard to define in a way because he has worked in so many different mediums. He emerged in Washington DC in the 1960s with works that elaborated upon the color school and he developed his own um, medium these huge drape paintings, which we'll show you in just a minute, um, which are a, to me, they sort of encompass, encompass the entire world. It's, uh, there's no beginning, no end. The range of colors are incredible and they come out. There's not a flat canvas that comes out into the world. I am not an art uh, expert in the least, but I've been very moved by seeing uh, the greatness of Karen's uncle. And uh, we want to show you a few pictures. We cannot, uh, it would take us hours to even do justice to the breadth of Sam Gilliam's work, but he's exhibited in every major American museum. He's been at two Venice Biennales. And, um, and then I'd like to show you some works from the Smithsonian. The first is entitled Swing, this gorgeous piece. As you see, this is the drape style. So it's one giant piece of canvas, which is, uh, draped and experienced in many different ways from different angles. Um, then recently there was a exhibit at Dia Beacon in New York, which uh, was is a huge space if you don't know, it's a remarkable museum. Here you see his piece Double Merge, which I understand is over 70 feet long. It's a giant piece. Um, in other mediums, he recently has been presented at the Flag Art Foundation with a exhibit which was called New Works on Paper. You see the giant scale of all these pieces uh, is really kind of breathtaking. And then most importantly to us and our connection, the reason Karen has to be five minutes late to that rehearsal is a remarkable piece called Carousel Light Depth. This is, it hangs in the, the largest uh, open space of the reach. And uh, you'll see it from different angles here. And then you'll see, uh, some beautiful pictures of Karen and Sam Gilliam. It is my great pleasure to welcome today, Karen Lowry Tucker. Hello, Maestro. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's really, really lovely to see you. I, um, I'm gonna jump right in and ask you, I know that both you and uh, Sam Gilliam have a tie to Louisville. Could you tell us, uh, could you explain to us how you both came from Louisville and what the, what the story is coming from Louisville to DC? Okay, well, my uncle and my aunt moved to Washington DC in the 60s. And my dad was taking our family on a family trip to Buffalo, New York. So we were driving from Louisville to, to New York 
And on the way, he wanted us to stop in Washington, D.C. to tour the city and for my mom to see her brother, Sam, and his family. So when we got here, I was maybe eight years old or so, um, I fell in love with the city. I loved the monuments, the sights and the sounds and just the vibe just resonated with me. And I didn't want to go to New York. I wanted to stay in DC. <laughs> and then when I saw my uncle, he gave me uh, paint brushes and paint cans and told me to dip the brushes in the paint and then just throw it at campus. And of course, what I made was nondescript. <laughs> I loved it. And he told me I was really good. So that sealed the deal. I wanted to move to DC one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And not knowing all the um, incredible events that would happen in your family at that time. And and can you can you explain to me what drew you to the violin? Well, well, my dad loved classical music and he played LP records all day, all the time. And he saw my interest in listening and mm -hmm. he um, got me piano lessons at age five. Um, but in elementary school, a woman from the Louisville Orchestra came to our class and mm -hmm. demonstrated the violin. And I really liked that. I really liked it. And she said we could take lessons. And that interested me. But I have to admit that I had an underlying motive. <laughs> we, were told that? That <laughs> we were told that these lessons would be once a week and during our math session. <laughs> and I despised math. So I, <laughs> so I signed up. <laughs> But the joke was on me because we know that music is all math. But wow. in my own way, I love giving back. So a colleague and I, Elizabeth, and her husband, Drew, we have a trio and a duo. And we play in the schools through the Kennedy Center. We play in the Washington, D.C. elementary schools. It's my way of giving back. Oh, that's beautiful. And I should mention that Elizabeth uh, pull you owen um, made the most beautiful um, gesture event she created this event along with several members of the orchestra um a, a couple months ago where they went to george washington uh, hospital gw hospital and played for the health staff there it was a very Absolutely. moving experience yeah yeah right. anyway that's just uh we can't in this program touch upon yeah. all of the amazing members of our orchestra but i wanted to mention that so back to math <laughs> I understand that you are going to uh, play for us a Baroque uh, sonata, and and the Baroque is very much based on rhythm and dance and style. Could you tell us why you chose this piece? Yes. Well, my dad always took me to my violin lessons from elementary school all the way through junior high. Oh, that that gives you my age. Middle school. <laughs> <laughs> as it's called now, um, because I couldn't drive. So he came to my lessons, and so he knew every song in the Japanese Suzuki method of violin playing that I was taught. Mm -hmm. so he had two favorites of all those pieces, and one was a very simple one um, that most people know. It's the Dvorak's um, Humoresque. So. Mm -hmm. And another was not so familiar. It's the Echo Sonata for violin and piano. This actually was written for a string, bass, and piano. But he loved it a lot. It's just a very simple Baroque um, sonata. And I always asked him why he liked it so much and not the other flashy pieces that I played and that he likes mm -hmm. to hear me play. But he said that it just spoke to him. He loved this piece. And as a young girl, that didn't satisfy me. I thought, no, I <laughs> just like it because you share a first name with the composer. The composer is Henry Eccles, and my dad was Henry Lowry. <laughs> so I teased him. But of course, in aging, I realized you know, it really spoke to him. So I chose this piece because I want to dedicate it to my dad, just to thank him for, first of all, exposing me to the wonderful world of classical music and also for that first trip to Washington, D.C. <laughs> so it's in four Beautiful. movements, but I'm just gonna do two of the movements. I'll start with the first one, which is a largo or a grave movement, and it's very slow. And so to keep it non-flashy like you wanted, I'm gonna just play it very somberly and okay. very little vibrato, but it's just kind of how I was feeling when my dad passed. But the second movement is an allegro movement, so it's peppier and more cheerful. and. That'll be my way of messaging to him 
I can't wait to see you again. Okay. Wonderful. So is there violin Good. and piano, but I will be playing it just for violin, two of these. Thank you so much, Karen. Sure. Bravo, Karen. That was such a beautiful performance. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's a bizarre element of our times that you can't hear the thunderous applause that's happening right now from all of us. But uh, it was really, really beautiful. And uh, all of the love is coming from us all over the place uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I ask you, um, uh, it's hard. One of the remarkable things I think uh, about performing and when it's meaningful like that, it's hard to actually break the moment that you just created. So I feel bad for doing that. But um, <laughs> can, can I ask the the piece right behind you, is, is that Sam Gilliam? Yes, it is. It's called Window to Snow. And it's very unique in that he used piano hinges to you could change it. You can either display it this way, very nice, or you could display it this way. So we just wow. happen to have it open like that, but it's really beautiful and unique. It's acrylic on wood. Wow. And you, I understand that you have a, a significant personal collection of his works. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. 
we're going to show a few of those pieces. Um, first, there's a large untitled um, piece, which is stunning. Karen, could you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. So my uncle has, of course, ex his style is extensive now, but he was one of the artists of the color field movement. And that mm -hmm. movement was of um, artists that used large scale canvases and dominated by color, just flat expanses of color. This one in particular, though, is wood. And it's eight different panels, all 23 inches. And um, this was gifted to my mother from him about a decade ago. And just about three years ago, she gifted it to me and to my husband, Val, but under one condition. We had to drive to Louisville and pick it up, take it apart and pick it up because she refused <laughs> to ship it. So it's an incredible puzzle. We had it in our living room on the floor for days trying to figure out the puzzle. It may look simple to you now, but it took us <laughs> hours to figure out that puzzle before we had it installed. Amazing. And it's hard to tell the scale, but that's quite large, right? It is large. <laughs> Um, and then we, I know that there's a piece called The Cup. Can yes, you tell us a little about that? Sure, sure. He gifted this to my husband, Del. Um, and we look at it and love it and continue to try to find the cup. <laughs> and there is no cup. I see a wrench. I see a tube of toothpaste. But I don't see a cup. And when we ask him, he, he won't tell. So um, in wonderful books that he's given me, I've read things about him and he has a quote I'd like to to read to you that really kind yes, of helps please. you understand that. Okay. He's, my uncle says, in abstract art, there is something hidden within the work, a little deeper so it can be sought after. When found, it has special meaning to that individual. So that's what we have to tell people. It's, the meaning is whatever it is that you see, what speaks to you. I, I love, love that. that. Yeah, we, it's very nice. Uh, we don't have real the time today to go in depth for it, but it strikes me that Sam's uh, or Mr. Gilliam's art is so musical, actually, and that, of course, one of the, the elusive elements of music is that it's abstract, too. So it seems to me that there are many co connections between his art and music. And finally, uh, there's a piece which is a screen. Could you tell us? I understand there's a, a special story behind this. <laughs> It's a funny story. Okay, I'll make it brief. Um, about 25 years ago, I purchased my very first condo in Washington, D.C. And mm -hmm. of course, I wanted my uncle to come see it. And he came and he approved. He was very proud of me. But before leaving, he called me an exhibitionist. <laughs> I could not understand why he labeled me that. And he said it was because I had no curtains. And <laughs> out of respect, I did not say to him what was going through my mind, which was, dude, I just bought a condo on my own in Northwest Washington, DC. Do you think I had more money for curtains? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad I held my tongue though, because soon thereafter he came here with, he came to my home with that wonderful screen. And he said to me, this is a start. Put this at your bedroom window. <laughs> so I'm really, what really grateful. <laughs> what an amazing piece to have as as your first piece of furniture in uh, your Absolutely. first apartment. Absolutely. Well, Karen, I, as I said earlier, we could go on and on, but uh, I just want to say again how moving it is to me to see this remarkable story in your family, the, the full circle of how uh, you came to D.C., uh, the, the way that uh, visiting your uncle Sam Gilliam gave you the feeling that you had a connection to this place and wanted to come here. Then you had 28 years with our orchestra. And in this past fall, uh, Sam Gilliam's art was exhibited at the place that you work, the National Cultural Center and the National Monument for John F. Kennedy. It's a, an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And I wish we could talk more, but I have to move on. So absolutely, I'm, thank you, Maestro. I'm giving you a virtual and socially distant <laughs> hug. Thank you so much. You. Stick around. We want you to come back at the very end, okay? okay? It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the bass clarinetist of the Washington National Opera Orchestra. She is the bass clarinetist and third clarinet. 
Her name is Ashley Boer, and she joined our orchestra in January of 2012. In fact, Ashley told me that she actually won her audition on 11-11-11, November 11th, 2011, which is a pretty lucky day. Uh, she's also a solo and chamber musician and a devoted educator teaching privately at her home, and she's also an adjunct uh, faculty member at Howard University. Ashley completed her BM, her Bachelor of Music, at the University of New Hampshire, her Master's of Music, and her Performer's Diploma at Indiana University, which I'm particularly proud of and approve of because I'm also an IU grad. It gives me great pleasure to welcome today uh, the wonderful clarinetist, Ashley Boer. Hi, Maestro. Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you doing? I'm, it's so lovely to see you. And actually, as I'm seeing you right now, I'm reminded that one of my very first experiences with the orchestra was conducting Aida. And we had a, this uh, duet uh, with this, a trio, really, you, me, and the singer, which is a giant moment for bass clarinet and an extremely moving passage. Um, so you're very much connected uh, with my um, impression of coming to Washington, D.C. and working here. Um, anyway, it's really lovely to see you. And I, I wanted to ask you, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your what initially brought you to classical music and specifically the clarinet? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a really small town in New Hampshire called Claremont. And it's, you know, kind of in the mountains a little bit. And we're not near any big cities. So I never went and saw an orchestra. Um, but I did have a cassette tape of Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker that I would listen to constantly. And I loved I thought was the clarinet. And I think in music class, we listened to uh, Peter and the Wolf. I think that's what, yeah. And, uh, right, yeah. It, um, and I have the clarinet. Um, and I went, oh, that's it. That's <laughs> that is. So I remember, I think I was in fifth grade, 12 years old, and I got pneumonia. And my mom, um, I begged her so much to go get a clarinet. And she went and picked it up for me. And my sister, Teresa, said that I got it. I had pneumonia. I was so sick. But I, I um, put it together. I don't know how I did this. But <laughs> and I played the Batman theme music, like, na 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 <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so, um, and then, you know, as I've gone through school, and I didn't really know what an orchestra was until, I think, late high school, which is crazy that I chose music. But I just loved playing yeah. clarinet. Um, and you know, I kind of went through school and got, you know, put on bass clarinet a lot, which mm -hmm. um, right today I'll play clarinet for you, but um, I'm a bass clarinetist. Um, and that's kind of become more of my specialty, but it just was kind of something that people said, here, do this. So, yeah. Very cool. And um, I understand that you're going to play for us today a piece which is an homage to uh, Zoltan Kodály, the, the great Hungarian composer. Um, by Bella Kovacs, who is a Czechoslovakian composer. Could you tell us uh, why you chose this particular work? Yeah, so, you know, when the pandemic started, I was pretty motivated to keep playing, but then as more concerts got canceled and it was looking like we were going to be doing this for a while, being at home, I was struggling to find the inspiration to play every day. So I kind of went through my music and I remembered these, it's a whole book of these homages to different famous composers. And I came across this one by for Kadai that I had never played before. And I started to play it and I was like, oh wow, this is speaking to me right now. And the reason why is that it has moments of like being a little more forlorn or reflective. Mm -hmm. And then a, it's a burst of craziness. Um, and it's a theme in variations, so it's a theme in six variations. So like every variation is different. So you'll have like a moment of like repose and then all of a sudden it's whoa, crazy. And I feel like that's reflective of the times. I feel like every day you're like hanging out, everything's fine. And then whoa, something Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's so poignant. Well, we can't wait to hear it.
Brava. Oh, that's a tremendous performance. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it It's so, you play with such a gorgeous tone, Ashley, and uh, also with such a theatrical spirit. I mean, I was talking earlier about how it seems to be that the people that are drawn to playing in an opera orchestra also have a real passion for telling a story and, and the theatricality. Yeah. And you, that's that was really impressive. Brava, oh. beautiful. Um, I wanted to, to say to our audience that it, it's more common than not in our orchestra that artists are married to, or their partner is another artist or another musician. And we're very fortunate today to be joined by Ashley's husband, Dana Boer, who is an extremely accomplished saxophonist. Now, this past year has been particularly memorable. I'm going to be upstage, but because you'll see why it was memorable. <laughs> because uh, both Ashley and Dana welcomed uh, the arrival of their daughter, Clara, into the world. In fact, Ashley had only returned to our orchestra from maternity leave six weeks before the beginning of the COVID crisis. And I wanted to ask you, Ashley, could you tell us a bit about your adjustment to all of this new reality? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you, when you have a child, um, you know, you put, you devote yourself 100% and it, like all the time forever but especially in the beginning it's such a big moment in your life and you you just devote yourself to this little yeah. human <laughs> and um you know i kind of put clarinet to the side and then you know i was like okay you know working up to coming back to work um like i'm gonna i'm a musician wow i forgot i do this <laughs> and i was just getting into the groove of it we we're doing three operas and i was doing all three and i felt like oh yeah this is who I am, you know, musician and mom. Um, and so it's been kind of, you know, it's like, she's a really good baby. I mean, you know, it's like, she's so good and good natured and we just love spending time with her. Um, but it's definitely with no childcare, you know, we have to become creative. Um, Absolutely. To get work done, like <laughs> meetings or um, practicing. So often, like right now she has a cracker, so she will say, <laughs> my chair while we play um, <laughs> which is what we're doing right now because she also like she likes to sing a lot when we play so but she might oh do. <laughs> well i look forward to that hi clara it's so nice to meet you and uh i wanted to tell you it wouldn't do justice to dana if we didn't say that he is a extremely accomplished soloist a chamber musician a clinician a pedagogue and he is a also a member of the United States Navy Band since 2011, an ensemble with which he has toured uh, over with over 18 states. Um, and he also uh, holds the baritone saxophone chair in the quartet, the Zizix Quartet. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Dana? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Um, I, you guys are going to play something for us. Would you like to introduce it? Yeah. So we're going to play um, an arrangement of the first movement from Mozart's Sonata Number no. Eleven, K three mm -hmm. um, and it's out of actually a two like a clarinet duet book that I've had for years. Um, we play it a lot, but we also I kind of thought we could play it because we, especially since Clara's here, we listened to it a lot when she was first born. Um, we just really liked playing it for her, and she really liked it. So, yeah. Yay.
This says it all. Bravi. Congratulations. <laughs> that was so beautiful. Bravo, Dana. It's so pretty. And uh, I, I went and got Alice in the meantime because I wanted her to see you guys play. And also, this, she's just absolutely captivated with other babies. Um, this is our daughter, Alice, who's uh, Claire is nine months old, right? Is that right? Yeah. 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 Alice is just one month ahead. So maybe they'll meet in preschool. She was very attentive, actually. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, every day is different. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us and for um, sharing your music with us and sharing your, uh, letting us come into your home to meet you. And it's just so great to see you. And uh, again, also congratulations on all of the new joy in your life. And um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see. Stick around uh, because we'll see you at the end. Okay. 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 Great. Um, the next artist that I want to introduce is Jeffrey Pilkington, who is the principal horn player of the Washington National Opera Orchestra and Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra. Jeffrey was appointed to the position of principal horn in 2014, but he also was uh, has been a member of the orchestra ten years previous to that when he held the fourth horn chair. Jeff has performed with the Metropolitan Opera, the San Francisco Opera, the National Symphony, the Seattle Symphony, the Baltimore Symphony, and also as a guest principal with the Philadelphia Orchestra. He was featured very significantly in our 2016 Ring Cycle, which was one of the highlights of the history of the Washington National Opera. Um, as you may know, the opera Siegfried includes a huge solo for horn, which is, uh, which is the... Um, musical element is actually a miming of Siegfried playing his horn call and this uh this solo is one of the most challenging if not the most challenging uh, piece in the repertoire for the horn and Jeff famously nailed it everybody talks about it um so we um before I bring Jeff on I wanted to to play for you a remarkable performance that he produced arranged and um, played in, which is a virtual performance of the work Sleep by the American composer Eric Whitaker. And uh, this, this piece uh, was debuted, this performance was debuted a couple of weeks ago and has been a sensation ever since. It's had over 390,000 views on um, YouTube and Facebook. And I think you'll see why this is an extremely moving performance. We're now going to play for you the next five minutes sleep, and then we will be joined by Jeff.
please welcome Jeffrey Pilkington. Hello. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Maestro. That, that was so, it's so gorgeous and so moving. As I said to Karen earlier, it's almost really hard to break the moment that you create. Um, Thank you. It's, uh, I want to jump right in and say that um, what strikes me about this performance, which um, separates it and puts it on a totally different level than most of the virtual performances I've seen, and there have been some excellent ones, is uh, the interaction with sound and color and almost texture. It's is as if coming out of YouTube, coming out of Facebook, we sense and feel, have a palpable sense of the sound. Um, and I wondered if you would be willing to talk about uh, your thoughts on that, how I should say to everyone that Jeff is sort of a, a leader in the orchestra uh, on this subject of sound, and he's very philosophical about it. And um, and he comes from a really important tradition. Could could you talk about that a little bit, Jeff? Sure. Well, um, this was a very special project um, on on so many levels. I think we were all initially kind of struck by going from performing regularly to being stuck and in quarantine. And we all have this creative output and need to constantly perfect our craft and engage and perform and all of that just, there was a vacuum and none of it was there. And um, shortly after that time, uh, Julie Landsman and Michelle Baker approached uh, myself and Nathaniel Silberslag and wanted to create a project and sort of, you know, put something together. And um, we talked about what that project might be and there was some, some discussion along the way. And this piece came up and we were all we were all taken by it. We think it's a gorgeous piece. It's written for choir. And uh, so there is no music that's you know already out there for horn. So it had to be adapted for horn. So we knew that there was definitely, you know, some work to do. But to answer your question, um, everyone on this recording is is very much connected and uh, mainly through Julie and Michelle, actually. They were um huge inspirations to everyone in this video and they are long time very high level performers they're both in the met together julia's principal horn michelle's second horn um and they're also very well respected pedagogues in their own right and um almost everyone in that video has studied with either one of these ladies and um my Wei Ping and I were in school together at the same time studying at Juilliard with Julie as well as Kevin Rivard who is now Principal Horn in San Francisco Opera. Wei Ping plays in the Washington National Opera. And uh, Nathaniel is the Principal Horn in the Cleveland Orchestra, but before that was a member of our section, the Washington National Opera. Yes. Um, Bob Reardon um, has, has played for Michelle and Julie often over the years, and he is also a member, uh, he plays at the Kane Center with the National Symphony. And um, so there, everyone is connected in that sense. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention also Julia Pilant is a, was, uh, had studied with Julie and is a member, a current member of the Met Opera and was also a member along with Julia and Michelle and remains there now. So um, we certainly all have a lot of the same ideas about sound and about the approach on the on the instrument. And that stems from, from this idea. And I would say that um, there is a particular tradition that it's attached to, and um, it lends itself to um, thinking a lot about the sound and the color and the homogeny and the blend with everyone. And that comes across so clearly. The the blend is, and and I think again, why you don't see this in many of the virtual videos, you actually sense a connection between all eight of you. There is, it's not just the music making, but you all are actually kind of Zen in a way. I hope not to make it seem trite, but it's so clear that there's this deep connection between all of you. Um, and I, I, I think it might be important to say to the audience, it's hard to encapsulate in our small program here, what it really means to be a part of a musical family like that, what it means to be part of a studio and a tradition and a line like that. I can imagine it actually pretty moving for you probably to play with Julie um, anytime, but particularly during this very momentous time. 
Yeah, absolutely. It was really fantastic to be able to connect, although not being there in person, which of course presents all kinds of um, new hurdles to deal with. Um, well, can I can I take sure. right just based on that? It's a perfect lead-in to my next question, which is. How do you, I think people are asking, really fascinated, how do you accomplish the technical aspect of this um, when none of you are able to be in the same room uh, and yet you created this seamless performance, which not only is together, but also has a lot of ebb and flow in it? Absolutely. Well, um, we spent a lot of time, um, ultimately, Nathaniel and I produced this and, and did all the arranging and the editing and the mixing. And there was a lot of conversation that went into trying to figure out how to do it. Because to be quite honest, we've never done anything like this. This is totally new territory. And, and this is sort of um, a way to throw in a lot of that need to uh, create and, and learn something new while not being able to go to work. So it started with studying. Um, uh, there's a great recording of this piece. Um, by Voches 8, and we we really appreciated what they did, and we were talking about how to put together a recording like this, and there seemed to me to be two possible ways to do it, which would be to have everyone simply play along with this YouTube recording, which is fantastic, you know, use it as a reference recording in your ear and play along, and everyone can send me video, and, you know, hopefully it'll come together. Um, <laughs> But there's a caveat to that in the sense that you are then locked into their musical interpretation, their tempo, um, their rubato, their intonation, their inflection, um, which again, it's an amazing recording, but we want to make it our own. And this was mm -hmm. for voice as opposed to horn. And so what we, we ultimately decided to create our own click track to send out. So it was a custom click track and it had to begin with us notating everything out. So mm -hmm. you know, and I spent a lot of time in conversation. We would send this back. We would send the, the score back and forth to each other, make sure there are no mistakes from what we were hearing on the recording, make sure we adapt it for horn. A couple lines were manipulated in a way to pass between the voices that would suit the instrument a little better. And then there's also the fact that we aren't using lyrics. And so the score that the singers would use, they don't have, there's not so much instruction in terms of an articulation as there would be for a typical brass score because it's mm -hmm. inherent with the lyrics. And right. since we're not using lyrics, we wanted to make this as vocal as we could. So we spent a lot of time deciding on which articulation it would be and where we would feature each voice. And in particular, where we would breathe. And we wanted to have group breathing and phrasing. So we actually marked all of this in before we sent it out to anybody to try to get everyone on the same page. And um, it, became it strikes me that you are actually almost a co-composer of the this product, yeah. right? I don't <laughs> want to take anything, not to take anything away from Eric Whitaker, but the, no, yeah. the amount of detail that you put into the preparation was is actually a unique and new type of form really well it's it struck me as we were putting this together that ultimately you do have to predetermine the musicality and the shape and the tempo the robot right. all of it or right. when are you going to do it i mean i don't have the technical prowess to do this on the mixing end i can't just have them send me the notes and i just plug them in nor would <laughs> that be organic anyway right so what we found was that we had to draft musically what we want ahead of time. And right. so what we did was we baked it into the click track. And a lot of that is simply not just the tempo that we chose, but a lot of times if you know if we want to do an Achelle Rondo over 10 bars, we can right. sort of bake that into this click track subtly with even not even alerting. I mean, it's not like we told everyone where we were changing it and what the number was right. going to be. But we put a click track on that had subdivisions so that they would be tuned into this and then we would just simply allow these these great artists that that we're sending this out to to do their thing and play along with it to use their Jeff, that's, a, that's the perfect segue because we okay. do have an ex we have two examples to show sure. um if you don't mind let's let's play first the what is really the lead in the sort of technical element of how you synchronize everything correct okay. One, two, three, four, clap, 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 two
two, three, four. Bar one, two, three. Sounds so like this, electronica now. <laughs> yeah, this is MIDI, right? This is MIDI technology, yeah. right? So after we did the score, we entered in every single note into Logic Pro, which was a new program for me as well. And what we did was we entered in all these parts and actually worked in some dynamics into the MIDI. And, wow. and we, we put our click track into that. And obviously you're hearing my voice voiceover, which is to help facilitate everyone to know exactly where to come in. And the clap, yeah. if anyone's wondering, is that so yeah. you go to mix later on that I don't have to worry about lining up the first note at all and I can just find that spike on the waveform. And yeah. that would be really helpful to get everything lined up. Very yeah. cool. And then our second example shows how you accomplished uh, Rallentando, is that right? How, yeah. how you and got a slow down. And to get out of a fermata and come in together. <laughs> exactly, let's listen to that now. One, two, three. Great. So it, it, don't take this the wrong way, but it strikes me that there's also a really cool element to that. And I can see a German techno club getting into just listening to the click track. I can't tell you how many times I listened to that click track before. <laughs> it, because we just felt this, this sense that once it's out there, we're going to receive what comes back and then that that's it. And so right. we spent a lot of time, I, I play through every single part and make sure it worked. And what I found was that the recording that we had listened to for voice, it didn't work as well for breathing and making a phrase the way we like to do it on horn. Um, one of the things we talked about was the range because it's written for human voice and not horn. It turns out it's pretty, pretty high for our instrument and we had talked about transposing it uh, to make it a little more approachable at some point, but ultimately realized that, you know, each key has its own tonality and color to it. And really the one brought home what, what the piece was about. So we decided to go ahead and keep it, um, which- Meaning was, that you hit some really virtuosic notes in there. I mean, incredible actually. It's up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now it, it does strike me actually that we should do a, we should do an interview about this and maybe even write it up because it's really impressive what you did. I, Jeff is humble. Uh, I'm speaking to the audience, but Jeff is humble. He dove in head first and learned a huge amount of new skills um, to create that gorgeous product. So bravo to you on that. I don't wanna, um, I, I could spend much more time talking about it, but I also want to point out the fact that uh, in the, uh, same vein as everyone else that we've been talking to today. You live in a very musical artistic household. Um, Jeff's wife, Catherine, is the uh, co-art or is the artistic director, is that right? Co-artistic director. Co-artistic director of yeah. Company C, which company is a remarkable, e. Company E, I'm so sorry, Catherine. <laughs> company E, um, which is a Washington DC based modern dance group and a, Jeff and Catherine met at Juilliard, uh, and he has two sons, Colin and Gavin. Can you just, I mean, it doesn't do it justice, but could I just ask you in a, um, quickly a, a bit about what it's been like for your artistic family during these COVID times? Sure. Um, a little bit crazy as it's been for everybody. Um, Gavin, our oldest son, was finishing up his kindergarten year, and so that moved online. And we found that we had to come up with a lot during the day to um, keep them occupied and interested and learning and do our part to all of a sudden be a homeschool teacher along with everything else. Mm -hmm. And so um, a typical morning, um, my, my wife was able to upkeep a lot of her work. So she would, um, she's also a personal trainer and she was able to train outdoors and sometimes over a Zoom. So Catherine would leave and, and 
be out of the door first thing in the morning very early and I would do breakfast with the boys and get them ready and Gavin would do his school on 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 the computer and basically Catherine would come home and need to grab the computer and go downstairs to join her Zoom session with the dance company, which upkept a lot of work during this time. And they worked with choreographers from around the world. They presented series just like this um, weekly for a period of time. And so they, they would work on choreography based on their home from about 10 in the morning until two. And, um, and then I, I was also like initially trying to put a lot of this uh, creative input into something else. And um, I got very into coffee roasting, which is something I've been doing for a long time, as well as woodworking. I've built a lot of furniture and picture frames and even a deck in my neighbor's backyard as recently as a couple weeks ago. Amazing. And so we've all been kind of very busy and trying to remain sane. And then this right. project kind of came in on top of it. And sometimes I was doing the editing at two in the morning because it was when everything was quiet and I could sort of <laughs> you know, zone in and find that Zen. But, you know, yeah, that's a little bit what it's been like. It's been good though. Wow. We're, we're happy to be together and, and be able to spend time together as well. Well, I wanna share with you all this, an amazing video. I mentioned earlier the Siegfried uh, horn call that Jeff played in the uh, 2016 ring cycle. At the time, uh, he and his son, Gavin, made a very special performance of that. <laughs> Ready to do a, a little Siegfried call? Yep. Okay, let's do a Siegfried call. Ready? One, mm, and, ready? That's amazing. My little helper. On, on so many levels. Wow. <laughs> they were probably really very good during the practice that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't go away. I want to uh, now bring everyone back. Um, if, if Karen and Dana and Ashley would join us as well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, that amongst all the multi talents of our orchestra, there is a person who is a food connoisseur, a restaurant owner, a barista, and a sommelier, and one of the most talented tubists that I've ever met. His name is Seth Cook, and he is, in addition to being our principal tubist, the co-owner of the Tacoma Beverage Company, and has been really an amazing force for good in this entire COVID crisis. Uh, Seth was the person that donated meals to the event at George W. Uh, Hospital, which I mentioned earlier, and he's been supporting members of our orchestra family in many unsung ways. Now, Seth, in his typical generosity, has presented us all with a bottle of sparkling rosé because it is now, uh, as I see, 5.08 on Friday afternoon and the perfect time to start happy hour. So um, I'm going to ask that uh, my wife, Suna, and Alice are going to rejoin us. And it looks like you guys have already opened up. Is that right? We have. Jeff is remote. Jeff, we're so sorry that you didn't get the sparkling rosé in time, but we owe it to you when you're back. <laughs> and uh, I'll take the baby and then we'll... Uh, it's okay, I found it. Down. Oh, nice. Okay, very impressive. <laughs> so I just want to say uh, to all of you, thank you so much for doing this today. It's so special to even if this is virtual, the chance to gather like this is a very um, special experience. And I'm hopeful that it's not gonna be too long before we all come back together again. I cannot wait to see you all. So cheers and to your health and safety and, and, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Clara. And thank you all for your really, really beautiful music making. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Cheers. Seth, that is excellent. Yeah. Really, really tasty. It's, it's an Austrian wine. Um, 
very appropriate as we had Mozart today. And um, I think that we're going to close today just with a, a, uh, the end of a performance that we all made as the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra, the Washington National Opera, including our chorus, in, um, which is a performance of Puccini's uh, humming chorus from Madam Butterfly. So as uh, you go into your happy hour and into your weekend, here is the humming chorus from Puccini's Madam Butterfly, played by the Washington National Opera. <laughs>